We have uh, Sarah Hammersma from uh, Syracuse University uh, joining us. Uh, Sarah is an associate professor of public administration and international affairs at the Maxwell School at Syracuse. Uh, formerly, she was a faculty member at the University of Florida. Uh, her research expertise, in, especially in recent years, has been on the economics of food insecurity. Um, and uh, her work has been published in, in, in leading journals, including the Journal of Public Economics, uh, the Journal of Health Economics, and Journal of Policy Analysis and Management. And today, uh, Sarah is visiting CHEPS to talk to us uh, about uh, SNAP access and uh, young adults' educational engagement. Thank you so much for coming, Sarah. Thanks so much, Joe. Appreciate it. Um, thank you again, everyone. I've met many of you today. Thanks for inviting me to join uh, the wonderful cast of characters that you're inviting through here for CHEP seminars. Um, what I'm going to be presenting today uh, is uh, the paper that you got for those who looked at it ahead of time. Uh, as you can probably tell, it's not a traditional economics paper or academic setup. It is a grant proposal. Uh, and so um, the reason for that is simple. I was working on it as a grant proposal, and that's the form that it's in right now. But what I hope is that it actually uh, gives you a little different sense of what it looks like when you're trying to pitch your work uh, in terms of um, getting grants uh, as compared to how it might look when you are writing the academic version of the paper. Um, and what that means is, uh, as, you're, as you were looking at that, you probably saw a lot of redundancy, a lot of things getting hit over and over again. Uh, I recently talked to a colleague who first learned to write papers by writing grant proposals, and he said, now he always, in his papers, is too redundant and they make him change it. So I, I'm learning the other way around. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out the right amount of, uh, of uh, sort of re-hitting the same points to put into a grant proposal. But if, if you found it a little odd reading, that, that's by design. Sarah, um, where is this under? Can you say oh, which agency? Sure, I'm very excited about it, actually. This, and for all of you who you know, give up hope easily, my third try sending an LOI to WT Grant Foundation, reducing inequality. My third try with an LOI finally got me to the second round. So I feel we all need to celebrate. It's like an R&R. &R. You just have to, more and more, you have to celebrate that middle step. Nothing's guaranteed in life. What, what is the foundation? WT Grant. So they, uh, they have a few different grant kind of uh, themes, and this is the reducing inequality theme. And the WT Grant Foundation is interested in children up through age 25, so children and youth. Um, and this contribution, I think, is an interesting one in the sense that a lot of their work is on children, and this really is trying to look at the upper end of that age distribution that they're uh, concerned about. Um, and I think the work that, uh, what I really like is, if we think about all the work that's done to try to improve educational outcomes for smaller kids, if all of that work gets them to high school, but they don't go past, uh, there might be a sense in which some of that investment isn't bearing out the way that it could if we can just push them over the finish line and get a two-year degree, or even get a four-year degree. Um, so we're going to be thinking about post-secondary education today. Um, uh, the other thing that, that's, of course, strange about a grant application is the work is not done yet. So the ratio of preamble to results here is very different than a regular paper. Um, but I hope you enjoyed the preamble. I enjoyed writing it. Um, this is joint work with two people, Matthew Kim at the University of St. Thomas, which is in Minnesota, not in the Virgin Islands. <laughs> He's very tired of being asked that, so if you ever meet him, don't ask him. <laughs> it's in Minnesota. Uh, and Warren Brown, who is a sociologist who um, runs a, a lot of the data center stuff at Cornell. Um, and so part of the project is with Matt, part is with Warren. Um, and so here's our sort of uh, our big picture introduction. Education has been called the great equalizer. It's the thing that allows people to have equal opportunities, even if other things in life were not granted to them uh, in equal proportion. So uh, our concern is that if there are pre-existing inequalities in educational access, that those might lead to differences in future educational investments, um, and in particular, that this would perpetuate economic inequality instead of mitigating it. And if education is supposed to mitigate inequality and it's not doing its job, we have a problem. Um, the other piece of this, and the two pieces we're bringing together, are that we do know one thing about academic success, and that is people need reliable access to food to do well academically. Kids do. We know it about kids. 
Food assistance programs in the U.S. primarily serve children and their families. Um, but what we're interested in are young adults who don't have kids yet necessarily, uh, who are out on their own, and uh, we want to be thinking about the academics uh, opportunities that they might face and how food figures in. Uh, so you can think about this as a, a problem that we're trying to state and a solution we're posing to try to understand more about it. Um, this is a quote from a piece called The Decline of the Great Equalizer in the Atlantic. Income inequality is soaring because the poor are losing an education arms race with the rich. And I'm going to show you a little bit of evidence on uh, where that sort of argument comes from. So the problem would be educational inequality. What we're going to investigate is one potential policy lever for reducing inequality in post-secondary education by socioeconomic status, which is simply access to food assistance. The same access that we grant routinely to children in schools. Um, thinking about how that fits in. Um, and so being more specific, we're looking at how educational decisions of young adults, and that would include college matriculation, so entering college, retention, and completion all respond to access to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, formerly known as food stamps, um, which currently restricts eligibility for these very people that we're interested in. So my roadmap for the talk is, first, some motivational material. Why focus on education if we're thinking about inequality and food? What does food even have to do with this? Uh, and what food assistance is really available to college students? So that's getting at the setting. and then. Uh, the more uh, sort of traditional academic roadmap, what are the hypotheses we test, what are the data we use, what methods do we employ. Um, uh, we use a lot of data sets in this project, so I want to give you a little sense of the advantages of the variety we have, what they each bring to the table, and a little bit of preliminary estimates. Uh, and that's where it'll end. You don't actually get the estimates we're trying to get because we haven't done them yet. Um, but what I'm looking for today, by the way, is any feedback you might have since we're early in the estimation process, especially about things you think we could do to um, bolster up the empirics of the paper. Just a question. What, what do we know about the evolution of, of, uh, of, of food plans on college campuses and how mm. prevalent they are at, uh, far less, I know, at sort of community colleges? Yes. Yeah. What I found getting into this literature the last few years is Everything I thought I knew about college was wrong, uh, in the sense that it only applies to this s slice of the income distribution. Um, I, I don't come from a high income family, but I went to a liberal arts college with residential dorms and food place, and you had to buy the food plan, and you, I got a lot of financial aid. I didn't have a ton of money. But um, the, I want to say, I, I should have actually brought this slide. I think something like, 70% of students now qualify as non-traditional according to NCES standards. So there are not that many students who are having this sort of on-campus food included sort of experience. So the people we're thinking about on the margin are, like you said, community college. Um, essentially, there are no mandates related to food um, on those kinds of campuses. So for the most part, we're thinking of students who are commuting and who potentially bring food from home. Um, the big public uh, journalistic stuff on this is at traditional four-year colleges. There was a big piece uh, in the Washington Post about George Mason. Really fascinating, you know, these kids who are at this very high-end school who don't have food. Uh, there was also a famous case with, uh, you might remember, a UConn basketball player who said he was hungry uh, and actually uh, generated changes in NCAA regulations because they weren't allowed to feed their players real food because it was considered a gift or something. Uh, so it was a very, it was very odd. Um, they could give them a bagel, but not with peanut butter on it. There were these arcane NCAA rules. There's a very interesting number. About 45 percent of the students in some of the colleges are food insecure. Yes. And it is also true even in the higher income colleges, higher income institutions. For example, we right now have some food insecurity program in UCSD. Mm -hmm. The one in San Diego State is supported by the student government. Mm -hmm. So this is a very, very interesting. And yesterday there was a very interesting article in in New York Times. Oh, I uh, yes, a, 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 a fellow who is an assistant professor of education, who was a student at Amherst College, something, and he <coughs> describes the whole thing. That is, the success of this thing depends upon 
the social environment that you put it as a prerequisite. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting article that appeared yesterday. Okay, I'll find yeah. that. Um, California is at the front end of campus food security work. Yeah. So I went to, uh, a couple of years ago, I went to a conference sponsored by Sarah Goldrick Rabb, who does uh, tons of work on this, and she brings uh, advocates and academics and various people together for a conference. Um, and she had a whole contingent from California. Uh, it seems that they're really, um, there's some great movement in terms of thinking more creatively about approaches to food on campuses here. So, um, but partly because there is a big food insecurity issue on campuses. There's some debate, particularly between uh, sort of, unsurprisingly, sociology and e economics camps about how much food insecurity there is and how much of it is structural and how much of it is choice. Uh, so I've talked to people who said, well, of course I didn't have enough food in college because I spent my money on beer. What does that tell you? Uh, that, that's not really the case we're talking about here. We're not talking about sort of frat boys at rich college who, you know, don't have money for their ramen noodles or whatever. Uh, so, um, so I've been working to try to learn more about the context in which this is most important. And it seems to be mostly um, commuter schools, community colleges, and to some degree, uh, happening at schools, high-end schools that give a good financial aid package to a low-income student, but then that student doesn't have their living expenses covered. And that's like the Amherst kind I of think case. There's a very interesting Mason. thing in that article is that if students have enough food to eat during the semester, maybe, mm -hmm. during the vacation time, when they don't have any money to go back, and then they have to stay at home and stay in the school, mm -hmm. they don't have enough money to buy the food. So I yeah. think you will be able to increase the efficiency of this food distribution there by supporting the students living in the campus during mm -hmm. the period and who yeah. are coming from low-income families. Yeah. That will definitely will improve that. That article is a very interesting article. Okay, I will check that out. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to give you a little sense of the, of the story of college enrollment um, that drives some of our question. So this is for people ages 18 to 24, this is the bottom income quintile, and this is the fraction enrolled in college in 1986, 34%. So 34% of 18 to 24 year olds in the bottom income quintile are enrolled in college in 1986. And if we look through time, uh, look 30 years, 40, 30 years later, um, 30 years later, it's doubled. So this story right here looks very encouraging. Lots more low-income students having access to college. Uh, if this were the whole story, uh, then we would say, well, it looks like a good trajectory and we're getting somewhere. What's important, uh, there's gonna be two things, but what's important about this story on its own is this, it, this does tell us that the demographics of college students are changing and that we might need to be cognizant of that when we think about what they arrive at campus with access to in terms of resources. Uh, so, uh, hooray, like we want more engagement in higher ed, but also, we shouldn't be surprised that there are supports that might be needed that weren't before. So this kind of raises the question that, <clears throat> you know, in terms of thinking about the kind of this relationship between food insecurity and college enrollment, mm -hmm. is it simply the case that, that kind of this population has always been food insecure um, in that before it was just that they were working not in college enrolled, and then now they're college enrolled. But you know, if you cut right. kind of this income quintile, food insecurity hasn't quite changed, and so it's just you know this was a problem at home, and now it's it's, it's a problem that's being brought onto the campus. Or is there something kind of special about the interaction between going to school and exacerbating food insecurity? I think it's a great question. So. Uh, I actually, something I've been frustrated with in the literature, particularly in the, in sort of one chunk of the literature, really it always frames the denominator as the college students and then what fraction of them are food insecure. Right. But that denominator is changing mm -hmm. over time. And so uh, my instinct is that the food insecurity was there. We, have, we see food insecurity rates rising some over time, but it's nothing, it's nothing to the level of how much college enrollment is changing. So, so I think some of this is just mechanical. Yeah. Like those same people are now in school who wouldn't have been in 1986. And they were food insecure then and they're food insecure now. But there's also some anecdotal, and I would say more than anecdotal evidence, that's not giving enough credit, 
Um, there's some qualitative evidence that when you talk to students who are food insecure on campuses, that there really are, because of the tuition bill itself, they're giving up other things. And so that would be less mechanical and more behavioral. Right, and, and a budget constraint. Exactly. So, that, and, 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 and something I've been, I was actually just talking with a student about this the other day, because I wanna, I wanna see if there's some sort of theory that we could apply here. Um, so there's this interesting thing. Food is a basic need, right? We all think, okay, there's like food, housing, and clothing is what you learn as a little kid. These are the basic needs, and then everything goes up. Um, Maslow's triangle, right? That's, that's my extent of theoretical knowledge of Maslow's triangle. Um, hierarchy, right? Um, but what's interesting is students are paying tuition, which you would think is higher on the hierarchy, but then going without food, which is lower. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that I've been thinking about is to what extent is there some issue with some things you need are bills to pay and some things are items that have a price. So if you get a bill from your school, you feel you have to pay it. If you need to buy food, it's kind of up to you how much to spend on the food. No one's sending you a bill for food unless you're on a food plan. And again, that's not the case for most of the students we're thinking about. So there's, there isn't a bill in the mail. You have to pay your electric bill, you pay your rent, you pay your tuition, and food ends up being like the residual claimant of your income. And if you don't have any left, then you just are short on food, even though it's the main thing that you need to live. Maybe there's some uh, psychological literature on this, or some behavioral economics literature, or I'm not sure, but I, I'm finding it more and more mysterious as I think about how does food not get in on the ground level of like your expenses and your budget? Um, but I, my, my working hypothesis is that it's not a bill, so you don't pay it um, because no one can kick you out, like they can't kick you out of the apartment or kick you out of school or um, you know, arrest you if you don't pay the taxes or whatever it might be. Um, the consequences are just borne by you when you're just hungry and that seems to be um, people are last on their own list or something. If you have ideas for me, send them to me or tell them now if you have a I mean, this, that something has, out there. But that idea I think has really interesting implications in terms of you know <clears throat> potential policies, right? Yeah, you know, so a lot of people when they start and they're in the dorm, that you're required to buy the student plan. Right, right? then it's a bill. And I remember when I was, when I was a freshman, all my friends were freshmen, we thought, oh this is absurd, it's outrageous, you know, oh, yeah. making us pay all this money and you know, blah blah blah. But, in some sense, I mean, if your hypothesis, behavioral hypothesis holds, this could actually be by putting that as a bill, it's then seen kind of equally among all the other bills. Mm -hmm. right? You you kind of reduce an individual's you know propensity or kind of ability to you know to, yeah substitute to, away from food. yeah substitute away from kind of the the basic necessities. That, I think that actually could be yeah really interesting. And there's some sort of like, like eternalism a device kind of story, story or something. There is. I mean, which is why like George Mason will never. <laughs> but, um, well, yeah. that, I, I mean, I think there's this interesting, um, I, I actually wrote a piece, if you're interested in sort of like a thought piece that's really not uh, an academic piece, uh, I wrote a piece called Are We Our Students Keepers for a magazine called Comment, which is a public theology magazine. So totally, you know, off the radar of most people. But I really love this magazine. Um, they're thinking always about uh, sort of the common good and, and, um, and so this article is really me kind of thinking through this literature and this topic that I've been chewing on for a few years now uh, and saying, who is responsible for making sure students are fed? This is a philosophical question. Are you responsible for feeding yourself? Because there would certainly be a school of thought that would say, if a student can't afford to go to college and eat, they will have to wait to go to college until later when they can afford to go, right? That's one school of thought. It's the student's responsibility. Another is that the moment they arrive on campus, they are the university's responsibility. And the university needs to take ownership of the needs that they have. That view is growing. Uh, and it's certainly a, a growing view in the, at least the California group that I talked to. Um, that these are our students and we're responsible for making sure that they have what they need. Uh, then there's the idea that the government is responsible for them. And so maybe the university's job is to connect them with federal or state services. Uh, and so the, the piece doesn't resolve it. It sort of lays out what, what are these implications of these different views. But, um, so if you want to take a look, feel free. 
Um, so we've got, we've got more low-income students. So one can make the case that this is a, a good trajectory for higher education. So this is just repeating the one on the right. What I'm going to do now is show you 2016, but for the high-income students, the top quintile. Uh, and here's the thing. There's twice as many outside of college in this group than in that group. So this, is, this gets at that arms race idea. So education's been increasing, but there's still a huge gap. Um, it's, it's a gap that has consequences for lifetime inequality. And you can see that. I just grabbed this. You can kind of find one of these online. Uh, there's lots of people who've gone and, and plotted the ACS. So this is just a few years of ACS looking at education age earnings profiles and saying, you start out with different levels of education, your age earning profiles spread out. And this is, you know, if you ever teach or take a labor class, this graph is in there somewhere. Right? Um, and so if we think about this point as being a point where there can be uh, some level of intervention or some level of uh, something that would create some equalizing effect, it could actually take care of some problems that show up later on. I actually, this is part of why I think this work, uh, and you can decide if you agree with me, this is why I actually think this work can appeal to a broad political spectrum. Um, uh, on the one hand, it's about social programs, it's about SNAP and intervention, and cash, almost cash assistance. But it's also about strategically offering assistance for human capital investments that would allow people to be self-sufficient. Uh, and so I actually think that there's a lot of room for this kind of work to be something that if we find an effect, we could pitch pretty broadly uh, as a policy issue and, and essentially argue there are certain times in life when these investments are really productive to make in food assistance and this might be one of them. And right now we've actually inverted it. Uh, so that's, I think that's where I'm gonna get to next. Who knows? <laughs> I have to remember what, the, what order my slides are in. Um, so I wanna bring uh, food in directly. We were just looking at the higher education profiles. Um, the education gap can reflect a lot of things, but there's some evidence that um, lower school performance and food insecurity go together than the elementary level. So there's, there's evidence that there, there are some economic inequalities that result in education inequalities for kids. Uh, that could be driving that remaining gap, or at least partly driving it. And then this is that new research I've been mentioning. It's usually small samples of college students uh, suggesting that food access insufficiency is a legitimate problem among lower income post-secondary students. Um, this set of people don't all agree on the extent of the problem. They would all say there's something there. Uh, Blag et al. Uh, uses the CPS and finds the smallest estimate of prevalence. Uh, Golder Grab's work always finds the highest prevalence. Um, a couple of these papers are using samples that are really questionable in terms of estimating prevalence, like interviewing people in an area where you'd expect to find the food insecure students, so you get really high rates. Um, so uh, so these, there's a variety of, of quality here, but we do see this sort of consistent sense that there's, uh, there's always a meaningful minority of students, or possibly close to half, that are dealing with food insecurity. You said yesterday it's 45% in that yeah. article. That's not unusual to find in these. Um, no, I think in talking high. about the food insecurity, it depends upon the level of colleges. Mm -hmm. Junior colleges are different from the four-year colleges, yeah. and the four-year universities are very different. Mm -hmm. So I think if you are looking for a, uh, some sort of effect on improvement in education and quality of the human capital, you will have much better results when you are trying to em uh, emphasize the junior colleges mm -hmm. rather than the university level. Yes. So this is what we find that when you interview students for scholarships, we mm -hmm. do that. So when you do that, we find the students from junior colleges suffer a lot more from that than even the high school students. Mm -hmm. yep. So it, 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 I think the way the policy should be in terms of increasing the human capital of the society, I think emphasis should be on junior colleges. On the two-year margin, yeah. I agree, and, and uh, a lot of Boulder Grounds recent work is actually doing uh, survey work that's focused on two-year colleges. Yeah because that's really the margin where it seems like a little bit could go a long way. Yes. Um, so given the known detriments of food insecurity for academic and life functioning, that's well established in the literature, some socioeconomically disadvantaged students without sufficient supports may find themselves unable to finish college. 
So I said, we're interested in matriculation and retention. Um, and I think the retention is really important because we, we know the, the college debt crisis makes big news. So people are already talking about that. That fits in here um, because if a student leaves college, they've incurred mostly costs rather than benefits. Uh, and so um, if we're thinking in terms of inequality, uh, if what we do is we get a kid to go to college for one year, we take a bunch of their money, they leave with no degree, we're actually increasing inequality instead of improving things, even though we've gotten them to matriculate. So uh, we really think both pieces need to be there. It sort of sounds like you're treating food insecurity as this sort of surprise <coughs> thing that happens. Somebody goes to college, they experience food insecurity, that costs them not to finish. Have you, is there anything in your data that's shown that food insecurity is actually just sorting people? Those that are going to colleges are going to the cheaper, more affordable colleges. And so when you're actually looking at this big increase in people that are low income and high income going to universities, going to colleges, is a distribution across, let's say, junior colleges, commuter schools. Mm -hmm. Has that changed as food security has expanded? Because if we're just looking at retention completion, it really, I think it matters maybe a little bit in terms of where people yeah. are completing from. Uh, I think so we need to dig into that more. The PSID data that we're going to use for part of the study would allow us to do that well because they ask a lot of very detailed questions to 18 to 24 year olds about education. So we would have a more detailed sense about what kind of school they go to. In most of the data, we don't know what kind of school they go to. So that's kind of a, that's a limitation that we face. Um, but I, I will note, uh, I guess, I think this will come up in a second. So. Yeah, it'll come up in a second. I have one more thing to say about that. Um, well, so what we're going to be thinking about uh, in terms of motivating a study of this is really two literatures, if you want to think about the academic literature. Uh, I didn't put it in here. The, the theoretical literature, I think, is something you'd, you'd be really, really familiar with. Ben Paraf. Have you heard of Ben Paraf? It's an old, old paper that says there's an age earnings profile, and it goes like that. Um, uh, and uh, essentially says, if you work out an economic model and figure out when people should invest in education, the solution is to invest early, right? So uh, if we think theoretically about the notion that investing early is the most optimal time to invest, then essentially this is a paper about are there barriers to the optimal timing of investment? And is there a way that food can help us think about moving people more towards the optimal time of investment, meaning to do the school as soon as possible? Mm -hmm. <coughs> when listening to all this, and I think you have a question also kind of brought this to mind, I've, I've been struggling a little bit in my mind to think about like, what's the margin on which we think that this really matters. And it seems that your <clears throat> the stories that you focused on have largely been the extensive margin. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering if you've given much thought to the potentially important in, uh, intensive margin, right, which could be captured you know, in a couple of different ways. One could be the actual you know, what are the schools that, that people are choosing to go to? Is that affected by, mm -hmm. you know, potential risk of food insecurity? Right. There's also, you know, the story that for those of us that, that believe there is actually human capital mm -hmm. investment, it's not just a signaling mechanism. Yeah, like, yeah. Could be a quality. Like, you know, how well do you perform in your classes when mm -hmm. you're there? And when there's mm -hmm. there, there's there's clearly some um, some physiological effects that could, could limit, you know, your, your learning ability. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are other margins on which, say, you know, major choice or, you know, how the classes that you choose to select yeah. or, or all this. So I wonder if you've given thought to kind of these, you know, what are the, the intensive margins that you could study yeah. rather than just kind of these extensive, I went and then I didn't, or I mm -hmm. didn't go to college because I couldn't do this, or I went to college yeah. later versus earlier. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is an unsatisfying answer, but uh, this is the answer that I have, which mm -hmm. is, when we first started looking into this project, um, we were trying to find data sets that had good data on both food-related things and education-related things. And so the really good education data sets would allow us to do all that, but they tend to not have enough information about food assistance participation or income or things that we would need. And so we ended up going with the data that had more food information but has more basic education information. Yeah. Um, but I do think we haven't we haven't plumbed the depths of the PSID transition to adulthood supplement yet, which is one of the data sets we're using, um, where they are digging in. And I don't know if they have choice of major, but I that at least we'll know what kind of school they're in. Um, because I do think there, there could be a margin of 
improving quality of school choice or diminishing or you know having food assistance mean that you choose a better school mm -hmm. but I don't think any of the data sets we're using now would get us what we need. Do you so have a like GPA not, or anything upon graduation? I don't think so. <coughs> I think that I think that what the PSID will give us is uh, if someone leaves school, they have an option to answer like why they left school, and so we're thinking of trying to think a good way to code that and see if we can piece that together with any of the food-related stuff. Um, I don't think they have like I was food insecure as an answer, but um, but we can dig into that. You heard me say theory, right? So you're yeah. Hey. You're Ben Porat, who just mentioned was my teacher in oh. introductory economics. No kidding. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, John Cannon made me read it, so you can so, thank him. So um, I'm reminded not just of his model of investment in human capital, but also of Mincer and Palachek, uh, because what it really is about is about choosing a, uh, between various occupational paths. Mm -hmm. One with more education, one with less education, mm -hmm. and then you have the overtaking age. Because mm -hmm. so many students, especially in, in uh, junior college, also have jobs. So it's not just mm -hmm. a choice between how am I going to spend my budget? I'm getting, you know, the, the, I'm getting this much budget and food comes last. It's mm -hmm. also the decision, am I just going to study or am I also going to work? Mm -hmm. And if I work, am I going to, and many people stop uh, the enrollment in school, it's not, you know, the, the picture that you present so far, I'm sure I'm not teaching you okay. something you don't know, but the way it's presented so far, it's like, you know, here is this big, big equalizer and you just have to get in the right, you know, moment into this education machine and then you're going to get rich. Uh, but in fact, people have constantly have choices between various um, profiles of what they're going to do. Are they going to you know, invest in their education now and then get there? Or are they going to do what Zuckerberg did and he's going to stop college and went right away into his Facebook stuff? You know? like that, that, it's not just about, about, about how much of your money you're going to spend on food. It's also how much money are you going to make? Yeah. Which you among while you're a student or instead of being a student. Mm -hmm. It's all related. Yeah. Yeah. Just so you get a framework for, think, for, for thinking about this. So the, so the literature that's looked on uh, at the effects of uh, uh, access to food stamps for younger students, mm -hmm. right, has, has done things like exploiting the, 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 the timing of receipt of benefits mm -hmm. and the earning exam, those chats. Yep. Yep. That's the new one. Yeah. Yeah. Chad's paper. And, and Orgul and John, because they were my classmates. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> They're the two co-authors. And and and, um, and then the school, you know, uh, uh, using the RDD design around yeah, around the school, school breakfast so program. Chuck Quartermunch has done, and Dave Frisbold have yeah, done. So, so how do I, just how I think about sort of food insecurity, what that could mm -hmm. be sort of capturing along the age distribution, you know, to why I guess this sort of gets it what I know you plan on using sort of an instrument for SNAP participation to get at it, but I, but I guess but I guess thinking of the different sort of selection of what food insecurity is reflecting among the college age students, sort of mm -hmm. to what to to what extent is this sort of sort of related to money management kinds of things, to right. what extent is this uh, because the, most of these questions are about going without f f food for a particular lengths yeah. of time. Or worrying about food. And yeah. and, and and I, and I guess that second, in terms of dietary habits, how closely is this linked among this age profile to things like obesity and so? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this particular paper isn't going to delve much into measuring food insecurity itself, uh, because it's it's really focused on SNAP with the sort of some with food security being the assumed reason you would try to get onto SNAP, mm -hmm. but. Um, we have another uh, piece of work that where we're looking on, we're looking at food insecurity directly, and actually using PSID to connect childhood food insecurity to food insecurity of the same people as young adults. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a correlation of about 0.3 in mm -hmm. food insecurity from childhood to adulthood, um, which is lower than you might think. Uh, I don't know if that's. Uh, I'm seeing the same expression on your face that I have. Like, um, 
One of the interesting things about food insecurity is it's more volatile. I think it's more volatile than other measures of hardship. Um, but I do think we run into problems trying to measure it right at that 18 to 24 age, because we're looking at them in their mid-20s, in their childhood and in their mid-20s. I, I do think that the, the questionnaire itself might not be very useful mm -hmm. because of what you said. Like, there's the choice, so it will say, like, did you skip a meal because you didn't have food in the fridge? And that might just be pure irresponsibility of a, an 18-year-old, right? Um, so, uh, so I feel a little leery about trying to measure food insecurity of 18 and 19-year-olds on campuses. Um, but I think if we can, if we can understand how their access to food assistance, whether their access to food assistance affects their take up of food assistance, that gives us some a little bit of a backdoor to thinking about who might be food insecure or whether they care enough that they are looking for assistance. Because one of my concerns about this project was I'm going to try to utilize these access measures, these waivers that should make it easier for some people to get them than others, and I'm going to find no first stage because none of them even care or are even trying. But I don't find that. I find that the participation does follow the rules, and so you get a sense people are looking into this and actually participating. Uh, and so, uh, but I'm not relying in this case on those measures because I do think they're a little shaky at them. And, and what are the other mechanisms you have in mind in addition to hunger, which I don't know how much um, of? So one of, the, one of the things that seems to come up in the qualitative work is um, the pure, like, the constant distraction of trying to figure out where you're going to get some more food. So people are using up their bandwidth, basically. Um, uh, there are a couple of campuses that have done some creative things. Actually, the campuses didn't do them, the students did them. Um, so one of, there, there's some student that came up with an app that would show where all the free food was on campus every day uh, at their university. And so people could just log in and they know where there's a reception going on or where there's something and like this right here, like someone would just wander in, like pretend to be, you know, part of this and just, you know, and they would have to come and actually attend an event. Like you can't just dive in and dive out. Like, so this all takes time, like negotiating these, how, where am I going to go, where am I going to find the food? Um, and so there's the actual hunger that distracts the learning process directly, but I think it is, there's also this sort of time spent um, I think of it similarly to, I don't know if any of you read Evicted, um, it's a really interesting book. The amount of time people spend trying to find secure housing situations. Uh, it was very interesting to me because almost the whole book goes by and you never hear about any jobs of any kind. And, 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 and honestly, you realize by the end, of it, how would they have jobs? They spend all their time trying to find a place to live where they can stay. Uh, and so there's just this, this sort of constant like churning of meeting that basic need every day, and you never get that second level of being able to sit and pay attention to uh, attend to a task. Um, so I'd say it's a sort of a bandwidth story. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you're going to get to this, but how does how does the receipt of these benefits interact with, I, I, I'm thinking of a lot of our like junior transfers are still living at home or living in like multi like person households, mm -hmm. are they eligible, ineligible, and how does that kind of factor into your bigger story? So I was really shocked to find this, but I was reading very boring SNAP manuals for caseworkers because I was trying to understand this. Um, uh, there was a case where uh, they said, it's sort of like an FAQ for the caseworkers, and they said, suppose that there's a woman and her, she still has her youngest child and her youngest child turns 18 and they were a two-person SNAP household, what happens? And the answer is both of them get kicked off SNAP and then each of them can independently apply as an able-bodied adult without dependents and be a one-person household. It, it, so there is, there is this sort of cutting off of, of them being in the family case, the, the household case, even though it's a little artificial. Um, so residence doesn't seem to be. Is that is that eighteen? Yeah, yeah. That actually <clears throat> sounds like a really interesting identification strategy. You have the older yeah. sibling, right? They've got That's younger true. siblings. Kind of the, yeah. the age of <clears throat> of the kind of the youngest child in the household. Um, yeah. You know, as the it's older true. and like look at outcomes yeah. or whatever the older one. Um, uh -huh. And and if they're, I mean, this would be kind of along the story where they're living at home and they still have. You, know, they, you would think they might have ancillary 
access to these benefits because the house mm -hmm. will them. Right now you have, yeah. at 18, you have this shock where, you know, at least mm -hmm. the household head, if not, you know, everyone in the household then has to reapply. Yeah, um, and well, and even if they're not the youngest, the benefits for the household will ratchet down right. a notch. Right. So there yeah. might be, yeah, that's interesting. So I just need something where I know exactly when people's ages change, or at least close enough to be able to identify that. I have to think more about that. So that's a, that's a new idea. That's great. Um, so I want to just mention these two literatures that we think sort of come at our question from two angles. One is there's a lot of literature on financial aid. Uh, and there's lots of evidence that different forms of assistance can really affect college entry and completion. There's some amazing new evidence uh, I'll just tout because my colleague Kathy Mitchell Moore is involved at the University of Michigan, uh, where essentially all they did was they send these beautiful packets in the mail to kids all over Michigan who qualify to go to Mi University of Michigan for free. They already qualified, but you send them a packet that tells them that they do. And then they all show up at the University of Michigan. It's it's just stunning. It's the Norsky, right? Yes, but it's Kathy Mitchell Moore. <laughs> That's yeah. what I'm telling you. Uh, she was the postdoc. She was the postdoc on that. Um, so uh, so there there's tons of work that even even kind of there's small levers that you can pull to really get um, students uh, more connected and and improve retention as well. Uh, and so that generates the hypothesis that something like SNAP operating along the lines of financial aid could be effective. The other piece is that we have this evidence on positive academic consequences of food assistance in elementary and secondary schools, uh, partly SNAP, but mostly the school lunch program. Uh, so there, there's actual food um, given out. Uh, so this, this is my graph to suggest why we should be very interested in what's uh, going on with food assistance for young adults. When you're very little, there's lots of ways to get food. When you're in school, you can get food at school. Uh, in a lot of schools, that includes breakfast as well as lunch. Uh, there are after-school programs. Uh, this is true in Syracuse this year. Um, I know someone who was teaching in an after-school program, and they're actually adding dinner to the after-school program. Uh, so there's meals at school. Uh, and those are extremely well targeted in the sense that they're only, the food is only given to the child. So it's not household food, it's not in the fridge. Nobody else can use the food, right? It's just given directly to them. Uh, and their family might get SNAP. So you can see SNAP is available to the household uh, while their kids are small. Uh, and in a sense, it doubles up. The kid gets counted in the household for SNAP and they also get fed at school. So there's, there's multiple uh, means of access to food. And then you turn 18, and all the programs are gone except SNAP. And then what I'm going to describe is even SNAP is limited for uh, this age group if they don't have kids. Uh, if you have kids, then you're kind of cycling back in to the front end here, and you can get access to WIC. Uh, you can still get access to SNAP, and uh, it's not as limited. Uh, and then uh, once you're 50 and up, there's some additional food programs. You can continue to get SNAP uh, on, without any work requirements. Uh, and then there's more programs as you age. And so there really is this sort of unique little spot in the food safety net that's a little thin. Uh, and what's striking is that this thin spot in the safety net is exactly the time we, our other programs are trying to encourage educational investment, uh, which, is, which means we're, we're trying to suggest, no, don't work too much. Don't work too much yet. Now's the time to invest, but we actually we have a really thin safety net right then, um, which is which is like I said, why I think this actually kind of appeals across the political spectrum. This seems like a uh, something that is a, a timing issue that could potentially things could change without even a lot of additional expenditures. So what's limited about access? Well, many young childless adults are called uh, ABODs, able-bodied adults without dependents. Uh, mm. A bods, not a balance. That's John. <laughs> He's a person, but a bods. Uh, so able-bodied adults without dependents um, can meet income eligibility standards, but they still only get three months out of three years. Uh, any three years, and so unless they meet a work requirement. So a bods are subject to a work requirement of at least 20 hours per week. Um, this this requirement is strict enough that actually. Um, in some of our early investigation of the policies, we found that a few states had actually developed um, alternative policies that said that instead of 20 hours per week, we'll allow 80 hours per month. Wow. 
Oh, that's generous. <laughs> um, uh, which tells us that this is actually truly a weekly guideline because they had to change the guidelines to do 80 hours a month. Uh, so they want consistently 20 hours a week or more. Um, to the extent that 20 hours per week would interrupt class time, would interrupt homework time, or whatever it might be, uh, to the extent that it's not flexible enough to handle co-enrollment in school, um, our thought is on the margin this could really uh, influence whether someone is able to be successful in uh, higher education at the same time. So access is sometimes less restricted, and that's, uh, that's where, we, where we really get some uh, interesting variation for the purposes of this paper. States and counties that have poor labor market conditions can ask the federal government to waive the work requirements so that they don't have to take benefits away after three months. Uh, and uh, that means SNAP benefits can be distributed even if you're not working. Uh, in those cases, these waivers are the policy level that we focus on here. Um, so uh, we have two hypotheses. Sorry. Uh, oh, yeah. So in, Sorry. in terms of when they're just back to the, yeah. to the qualifications, is mm -hmm. it at, at a point at a point in time in, in, in which the, the labor market conditions are, are are poor, and for how long when they get better? Right. You know, so you usually you get a waiver that lasts about a year, but there's actually. There are cases where it's a different number of months at a time. I, I don't think it's less than a year, but there, there were some cases where they could get a two-year waiver at a time. I think that it's a look back of a year of the labor market, and there's a, um, there's a formula that drives a sort of, uh, so BLS sends out something that kind of says, um, these states seem to meet the requirements if they want to apply for waivers and then the states can apply if they want to. But you can also apply even if you don't meet the, the formula, you can make a case. Um, or you can choose not to apply even though your labor market's terrible, which several places also did. Uh, they just didn't want the waivers. Um, but it's, some, it's something comparing like where you are in the, uh, how far below the mean, un, or above the mean unemployment rate you are so. to be able to get a waiver. So then you're gonna, you're gonna be looking at how the availability of the SNAP benefits in certain areas versus not available in other areas mm -hmm. is going to affect um, educational attainment. But right. the, the problem I mean, is right. that they, if you live in a place like an Indian reservation where there are no jobs and there's a very high unemployment rate, you may also not have the incentive right to invest in your education because you figure what's this good for and there's no jobs here once I graduate. Right, so we're gonna be, we're gonna have to be very, very careful to make the case that we can identify the ABOD waiver effect distinctively from the local labor market. You're exactly right. That's really, I think, the hardest part of this is figuring out can we control for enough labor market features that we can then capture the effect of the waiver itself, which is affecting SNAP participation. And that waiver isn't just proxying for other stuff. So there, but there's no abrupt cutoffs uh, associated with, with, with qualifying a particular unemployment rate or so something? So I, like I, I have toyed with the idea of trying to see if I took the guidelines that are given and if I like gathered the unemployment rates and plugged them in, how close it would be to the actual waivers. But I just haven't done that yet. Um, um, but my, my impression is that those are not hard and fast rules. They're more like... Um, you should be able to probably get a waiver if you meet these, but that doesn't mean you can't get one if you don't. You just have to make the case. And, and the Department of Health and uh, BLS, BLS does the, well, yeah, well, BL, BLS provides the information yeah. to food and nutrition, or to USDA, yeah. which then sends out a thing that says, uh, hey, if you're in one of these labor markets, you can maybe apply for a SNAP ABOC waiver. So there's some... Do they get special packages? <laughs> Are they blue and yellow? No. Blue and gold? No, there's this document that comes up called a trigger notice to say, like, at th this point each year, they, they sort of say, like, here's, here's states that probably could get waivers or maintain waivers. What you'll find interesting, though, is, uh, at least I do, is we're going to be... Uh, in the longer version of the paper, really focusing at the county level rather than the state. And all, of, all the documentation and communication we can find is, is about states. We couldn't find anything on counties. 
uh, until we uh, ran across a, an amazing data set that I will show you that was not provided by USDA. Um, so we're going to look at separately in this case at um, first whether waiving SNAP work requirements actually increases SNAP participation in this age group. So uh, one would have reason to think that, of course, if there's no work requirement, there'd be more enrollment in something. Um, but this is something we need to check, and, it, and particularly we need to check in this age group. If we're thinking about a group of people who are perhaps just for the first time in a situation where they would do their own applications for social programs that were previously done by their household. Uh, so we actually thought that it's an, an important step, not just a formality. Uh, and then the second piece, of course, is the, the big story, which is does this easier access to SNAP, which leads to higher participation, actually increase engagement in higher education? So that's where we're trying to go. Uh, the ABOD waivers provide variation in SNAP access to help identify the role of SNAP in determining educational outcomes. Um, so here's this, uh, here's this beautiful map. Uh, if you go to this website, uh, that gives you a document that has a few of these maps, but you can actually find an interactive version of this with a little scroll bar on the top, and you can look at these waivers every year for, uh, I think, something like a 15-year period. Um, so the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities gathered a whole bunch of data and put together this infographic. It's an interactive map on their website. Uh, we've been working on this project for a while. We've been trying to gather ABOD waiver information. Anything we could find was just, we could find out if a state had a statewide waiver, or we could find out if a state had a, quote, partial waiver. And nowhere could we find what counties were included in the waiver. And in fact, the USDA is so helpful as to say something like, 14 counties, two municipalities, and three villages have a waiver. Well, which ones? <laughs> so it's, it's nowhere. I talk to people at USDA. Well, they think it's probably around somewhere, but no one knows. No one knows where it is. And then we find this uh, on the CBTV website. Um, and, uh, and so I contacted them, and I asked whether um, they would consider allowing this to be used um, for research, and in particular, if they would be willing to convey the spreadsheets that have the county FIPS codes so that we could actually use it without backing out the counties from the picture. Um, and we had some discussion back and forth about what we wanted to use it for, and, um, and they granted us access to the data. Um, and uh, this is just an example from fiscal year 2005. What you see is there are some states that have total waivers across the whole state. But there are lots of other places where the waivers vary. Um, and what that means is that we have really an opportunity. So here's your state, right? We have an opportunity to try to get at some of these subtle differences across local labor markets that we wouldn't get if this were all at the state level, kind of chunky. Um, we can get at the details. That means, though, that if we want to study, uh, if we want to use any kind of survey sample where we know more about people's educational choices and such, we have to, to link them somehow, so then we're going to need county level identifiers and any other data we use. So that's, that's why this project is taking a long time. Um, we're working toward that. Um, this is taking that CDPP data and aggregating it up to state level so that we could do a little proof of principle work, which is the estimation I'll show you today. Um, you can see in um, 2004, and we actually have it further back, but um, these are the years that we're <coughs> using in our analysis. In 2004, uh, the majority of states had a waiver somewhere in them, uh, and only a few uh, were without any waiver. And up until 2008, this was fairly steady. Uh, then we all know what happened in 2008. Uh, so you might think, well, this sudden change to these statewide waivers is because the economy collapsed. And you'd be right in a way, but there's actually something kind of nice about this. It's not just endogenous. It's actually also, uh, an executive order that actually said everybody, if they want a waiver, they can have a statewide waiver right now. For 15 months, the Obama administration did a free-for-all on the ABOD waivers. Uh, and so, uh, a few states still refused to take the waivers. Uh, a few didn't uh, do them <coughs> statewide, but most states ended up being totally waived. Uh, and then what we see is as the recovery is going on, and as there's no more guarantee, you can kind of see the bulk starting to float back up into the no waivers and the partial waivers. Uh, and in 2017, we're back to very few statewide waivers. These are not necessarily the same states. It is an interesting thing to look at on the maps. You can kind of get a sense. Um, uh, 
there's reason to think these matter because the think tanks on the left and the right both have a lot to say about them. So here's CBPP, a half a million adults are losing benefits. And here is FGA, finally we'll solve the food stamp crisis by getting people off this program. Here's what happened in Kansas when they got rid of the ABOD waivers and we can finally get caseloads more manageable, right? So, so no matter where you are, you think these are a big deal. Uh, and, and this really helped motivate us to think this is something that people would be potentially aware of. It's not one of these kind of hidden policies, except in the sense that you can't get the data on it. <laughs> um, so it's hidden, hidden by the USDA, I guess. Or, that really, it seems, I, I think it's at the state level more that we just, there's, some, there's no collating of this data. Uh, we did send out, before CBPP's map came out, we had sent out some FOIA requests to several states and so we started getting a few in, uh, and we did corroborate New York with uh, CBPP's quoting of New York. And we found that the differences that were there really were mostly about like, timing within year, the fiscal year versus the calendar year, those sorts of things. Most of the differences were pretty easy to explain, so we're, we're pretty comfortable with what they did um, with using that data. Um, so we're going to take a bunch of micro data to this, and I have about 15 minutes, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time describing it. Uh, I'm going to assume if you're interested, you can um, look into these data sets. We have the PSID, which is, has the advantage of being longitudinal and the disadvantage of being really small, uh, but longitudinal in the most beautiful sense. We know how people were doing as kids. We know tons of stuff about their households. We know about their grandparents if we want. It goes back to 1968, uh, I think. Uh, and so, uh, and we can follow them up through 2017. There's particularly good information for people who were kids in 1997 because they did a supplement. Uh, so we're gonna be grabbing a sample of people who were kids in 97, and we're gonna follow them uh, for 20 years. The ACS uh, is a repeated cross-section rather than longitudinal, but it's huge, so it's great. The SIP is somewhere in between. It's kind of big, it's kind of panels, but it's not a full longitudinal study because it starts over every few years. The other piece of this that we're super excited about is that we've got state administrative records for um, several states' SNAP offices. This is a full SNAP administrative data sets that had already been provided to the Census Bureau for researchers. So if you're familiar at all with uh, Bruce Meyer, Jim Sullivan's work on underreporting in surveys, this is the stuff they were using. Um, this is stuff that the Census Bureau has gotten from the states, gotten permission to give to researchers. Uh, we have seven states here. Those seven states are chosen purely on the basis of they are, uh, there are states that have provided their information and they have the right years for us to be able to use them consistently. So for all of these, we have at least 2004 to 2017. For some, they go back further. Um, and we know about detailed SNAP participation and we also have TANO. Um, so our methods are gonna be simple. Here's our first stage, SNAP participation on ABOD waivers and other stuff. The other stuff, is important in the sense that we have to do a good job controlling for the labor market or we're not going to feel confident that the ABOD waivers are actually capturing the policy as much as capturing the bad labor market. Um, so that's going to be something we continue to work on. Um, but the prediction is that ABOD waivers, meaning work requirement waivers, would increase SNAP participation. And so you can you can look at that certainly by, by age, but also by dependence as sort of a, I mean, it's possible yes. SNAP participation could have, could, could theory sort of affect the likelihood of having a kid, but if you thought about, a, a, about it as, as a falsification. Kind of yeah, so we, we are actually, especially in the PSID, we're nervous about trying to split out exactly the population of interest because it's going to get really small. Mm -hmm. But in the others, we're, we are going to focus on those without dependents in that age group uh, because there's enough data to do that. Um, and we, if we include those without or if we include those with dependents in here, it should just weaken it in the sense right, that it wouldn't. But you're right, it could be a falsification test event. Yeah, to I mean, to make sure it isn't driven by that group, any effect you find. Well, and, and actually that, yeah, now you're saying that makes me think that's actually a great way to think about whether we're netting out the local labor market adequately or not, too. Mm -hmm. So that, I like that idea of, of thinking of it as a falsification. We could run into the issue that uh, of this sort of a policy bleed over, like people know that there's these restrictions, but they don't really know which ones apply to them. So uh, it could be that we actually see something there even for those to whom it doesn't apply, like, like those, you know, the immigration papers and stuff, where people don't know that they qualify or don't qualify for stuff. Is, is, is there, 
And so, and, and so this depends on your, your, your eligibility depends on your county or your jurisdiction of, of, of residence. Mm -hmm. and, and that's always going to be where your local welfare office sort of is. It's going to be where the, at least it's where the waiver applies to you. So I think every county would have a SNAP office. Okay. That's my understanding. So you can't you, you can't go next door. So, so if 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 you're if you're you could move. Right. I think you'd have to move. Okay. Um, and what we're going to be using is the county uh, the county identifiers in the microdata. So uh, in the case of the admin data, that should be clear. But in the case of the surveys, it's going to be once we get the county level identifiers, it should be county of residence. Okay. So, but you can identify. I, mean, I guess I'm thinking more of those sort of few states where you've got a lot of coverage and then a few sort of right. county sort of next to each other. Whether anybody's yeah. sort, anybody sort of sorting over this depending on the. How I don't. It is. So um, I don't think it, now I'm seeing the connection with something that I can see why you would think of this because minimum wage, right? Like mm -hmm. people can move and go get a minimum wage across the street. I don't think they can do that um, because you have to get SNAP at the from the county that you live in. So, you yeah, so, you have to, you have to so it's different than a labor market. You, right. You have to move, you have to move to... Yeah. Move One to thing that we're doing in New York, I don't know that we'd be able to do it in other states, but because we have access to more data for New York, is we actually have some um, state-determined commuting zones that are different than counties mm -hmm. that we can use for local labor markets that I think it will be nice for enriching that set of local labor market controls. Because uh, we are a little nervous about just using counties. Uh, my colleague Warren always points out that uh, the county that Ithaca is in, where Cornell is, is like extremely poor county, um, but it's extraordinarily heterogeneous, and a lot of that poorness is all those students that are there, right? Who are not mostly actually poor, but who have low income on the census or whatever. So uh, he's always talking about Tompkins County. <laughs> Um, and then the second stage, uh, there's there's the uh, effect of SNAP participation on education investment, which is what we're really getting at. And um, for now, we're measuring educational investment kind of roughly, but uh, I mean, like Ryan pointed out, there's a lot of ways that we can enrich those measures of education, performance, other things about retention that might be more um, helpful for or quality of institution. I think we might be able to get at a little bit of that with the PSID, but not with the other data sets. Um, so we predict a positive estimate for G, that more SNAP would make it easier to invest in education. But no, I put in red, like, note the selection problem we have here. When we run this, G, in general, is not going to be positive. It's going to be negative. Participating in SNAP is associated with all kinds of other things about you that are correlated with lower educational attainment. And so the whole problem with this paper is really can we net out all those other things correlated with SNAP and actually identify a SNAP effect, a clean SNAP effect? And whether we're there or not is kind of a, you know, up for the reader to determine. But we, we know we're not there yet because we, at this point, have so much measurement error using state instead of county level data that we, uh, we're not ready for prime time. Um, so ABOB waivers as instruments. Little momentary econometrics lesson. Everybody remember the characteristics of instruments? So they, first they have to predict SNAP eligibility. Uh, that's tested in hypothesis one. And then they have to not themselves predict educational attainment, conditional on the variables already in the model. This is untestable. Doesn't mean we can't gain insight into whether it's a crazy idea or not. Uh, this is conditional exogeneity. Uh, and so our solution to this is essentially going to be trying to condition on anything we can about the local labor market and about any other demographic characteristics uh, correlated with SNAP receipt so that what we actually get out at the end is a SNAP, uh, a clean sort of SNAP estimate and the ABOD waivers are not themselves predicting educational attainment. Uh, so ABOD waivers, in other words, cannot be a proxy for the labor market. That's a problem for us. So we need, we need to separate those two things. Um, we do, we get an advantage from the fact that not all states apply for them when they can, uh, so that there's not a perfect uh, correlation. Um, so our approach is including a flexible set of local labor market factors, so that we aren't just picking up labor markets uh, with a lot of uh, I'm going to skip the parts. Uh, if you ever need to work with the PSID, you may borrow this beautiful graph that my co-author Matt Kim came up with. This is the survey year. 
In 97, there's a child development supplement. And then every two years, they go interview the families again. And then when you turn 18, you start answering the transition to adulthood supplement. Uh, and then in 2015, there's 2017 now too. In 2015, they actually start asking about food security again, which they stopped asking in 03. Uh, and so our other paper that looks at food insecurity as a child and as an adult takes advantage of the fact that it came back into the survey. Um, and we're looking at whether there's some uh, mechanism effect of education in that in that intergenerational transmission. Um, so that paper will be done soon, I think. Um, but PSID is very cool. Um, this is my first foray into it. Uh, then we've got the ACS and the SIP. Um, the key is here we've got this admin data for seven states that we can link to the SIP and the ACS. So the actual people get linked in. We know what their actual SNAP record says. This allows us to do two things, address the problem of underreporting in the survey, so we don't have to use their self-report anymore, we actually know, uh, and to do a county level analysis that doesn't suffer from the sparseness of the survey data. So the admin data can be used on its own if you aggregate up and then link it in with county level educational attainment and those kinds of things. You can do something um, pretty rich, and, you don't de and you're not depending on the individuals in those data sets, so you can use the admin data two ways. Um, this is New York's uh, relationship between ACS reported SNAP and actual SNAP. So we're down around 67% reporting in the ACS. So a third of recipients are saying they are not on SNAP, but they are. Uh, this, is, um, this is the kind of stuff Bruce Meyer and, and Jim Sullivan and some others have been working on, uh, and essentially making everyone scared to use any data like this for any study of social programs. Uh, it's bad news. Uh, and I do think this is something, they've been hitting, they've been kind of pounding this drum for a while. I think it's, it's gonna start catching on. We're gonna not be able to get away from this critique of the survey data. So, um, so start looking for admin data now. I was gonna say, how, how bad is, is it similarly bad in other, in, in, uh, in, in CPS PSID? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. CPS is also very bad. PSID I think is slightly better than the others, but not, it's not great. Um, I feel like this the same way I feel about uh, this might age me or maybe some of you aren't familiar with, but the SIP data, they have these waves, they ask you about four months at a time, and there's this thing called seam bias where everything seems to happen at the four month mark and it's just an artifact of the data collection. There was a time when you could just kind of say, I'm not going to worry about seam bias or I'm just going to use the first month, I've done work like that. But that time has passed, like we have to reckon with it. So I think we're at that point with with underreporting, we, we kind of have to start reckoning with this. Uh, so this is just a diagram of how the data will be put together. The PSID will be linked to the ABOD waivers once we get our county level restricted access PSID to estimate the effect of SNAP on educational outcomes, that'll be nationally representative. Then we can do the same thing separately with ACS and SIP, link it to the ABOD waivers. Those have county identifiers because they're in the um, restricted access data center that we have access to that also house the admin data. These can be linked in with that. This can also be used directly. So we've got this sort of amalgam of different ways to try to answer our same question and see uh, how consistent the results are. Uh, so we did a preliminary analysis just with ACS uh, for all 50 states, doesn't have county identifiers in it. And we linked it to ABOD waivers where we just coded up, does your whole state have one? Do you have some partial waiver or no waiver? So very, very simple. Um, we've got four and a half million individuals 17 to 25, so the, the size is fantastic. We've got great stuff uh, going on. Right now this isn't, oh, I should go back and check the code to make sure. I don't think this is trimmed to those without kids. It, I remember discussing it, but I don't remember if we actually made that cut yet. Um, so we're going to link them to the ABOD status. We're going to link in the unemployment rate at the state level for now. Again, that's just, this is just a sort of proof of principle. So about 14% of the sample uh, weighted received SNAP. At the state level, 48% of the observations in the ACS are exposed to statewide ABOD waivers. 8% uh, are exposed to no waiver, which means almost half are exposed to a partial waiver, meaning we don't actually know if those people were in an exposed county or not. This is why doing it with, at the state level is really a, kind of a rough cut. So, I'll just show you what we've got so far and I'll wrap up. Uh, this is our hypothesis one. 
does having an ABOD waiver, either statewide or partial, so we just put in dummies for both, does it increase SNAP participation? The short answer is yes. Uh, and it looks like about a 10% effect because the average was 14%, so 0.14. So we're looking at uh, some, uh, I think, strong evidence at this point. Uh, and we put in a bunch of controls, including state fixed effects. We've got time fixed effects in all the specifications. Um, and it looks like the waivers matter. So that's good news for us. Then we run OLS. We don't use the ABOD waivers. We just run OLS of SNAP participation on any college and SNAP participation on two-year degree or more. And we get uh, in the sort of correlation with only time dummies in, we get a huge negative. So if you're a SNAP participant, you're 20% less likely to go to college at all. Once we start controlling for stuff, we get that down to a 5% gap, but it's still negative. Our argument is that we cannot expect OLS to be able to do the work that needs to be done to make SNAP participation exogenous. So we're using the ABOD waiver instead, which we showed was strong. The question is whether it's exogenous. So that's what, you know, that's what you're going to be left with. Once we put in the ABOD waivers, especially when we add in the labor market control, which at this point is just the state unemployment rate, we actually get the sign to flip, which is exactly what we would expect if what the waiver ID does is actually uh, take out all that uh, the proxying that was being done uh, by SNAP participation for other characteristics. And we're now picking out the exogenous piece of the SNAP participation. Now we get an estimate that is absolutely huge at the end here. Um, 44 percentage point increase in any college, right? It's, it's not plausible. I'm not going to argue for it. Um, what I think is useful about this is that we actually can see that the instrument makes a big difference and that in particular it flips the sign the way we expected. And so what we're interested in is actually doing this without so much measurement error, being able to match at the county to county level uh, so that we feel like we can trust the estimates more. Because as it is right now, uh, it's, it's just not something that we would want to uh, hang our hat on. So, uh, so we do find ABOD waivers increase the probability of participation in SNAP. Uh, even if we include a lot of covariates, OLS doesn't seem to eliminate that raw negative correlation between SNAP and higher ed. But if we instrument, uh, the negative correlation does flip to become positive and potentially large. Uh, and so uh, a couple of caveats, again, nearly half of the person years in that study are under a partial waiver, and we don't really know if they're under a waiver or not. So we've got tons of measurement error. Uh, and right now, we haven't linked in the admin data yet to, to fix the underreporting problem. So we really have at least two different kinds of measurement error going on. Uh, so uh, our next steps include um, adding more labor market variables to try to really shore up the exogeneity argument and then begin working with the confidential data that consists of those county identifiers and also the correct SNAP participation measures from the admin data rather than the self-reports. So if you have any suggestions or ideas for me, please be in touch. Um, and thank you so much for your participation today. Sarah, appreciate it. So next week is a week off, and we return the following week with uh, Nicholas Seibarth from Cornell University, who's going to be here to talk about uh, the impact of, of uh, paid sick leave on, on labor market outcomes. So see you then. Have a good week.